I do want to move into the work that you do with um, Bishop Jackson, uh, who oversees all of the AME churches in Georgia. Um, for our listeners, AME stands for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, I had the privilege to meet you um, and to sit on a panel with Bishop Jackson in DC, literally five days before Ahmad's murder. Um, and Bishop Jackson had a press conference or release today at 12 noon. Can you give us some insight on what Bishop Jackson as a hugely recognized religious leader in Georgia and all over the United States, what is his message um, to other faith groups and, you know, especially around this incidence and what are other, what do other faith groups need to do? Because this is not a, 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 a fight that's, or, you know, I don't want to use the word fight, but it's not a platform that's only for a certain uh, community. We have to stick together. So what is his message as the bishop I think um, first and foremost, um, Bishop Jackson would want everyone to understand that yes, we are as a community of faith, in, and it is a fight, in this fight together. It is a fight for, against injustice. It is a, to say that we fight injustice does not mean that we fight any one individual or any group of people. The, the principles that guide um, the mind um, that would encourage and, and push a person to the point of committing a murder like this. These are the things we fight. These are the, this is the message from Bishop Jackson. He, he, he wants us all to understand that to, to sit back and be silent is to be complicit. We, we must, we must, as a community of faith, not be afraid to speak out against the injustices in the world in which we live. It is our job. It is our job as believers to speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves, to be able to say to the rest of the world, it is not okay. It is not okay for us to sit idly by and go to our worship experiences and praise in the way that we praise and then go home and sit back while others are slaughtered in the streets of our cities, our towns, and in our country. That is not, that is not the character of a country that prints on its currency in God we trust. That is not the character that should be displayed. And it is up to us to not be afraid to speak when our communities are threatened. Politics is not off limits simply because of the separation of church and state. It, we, we must be able to speak to laws that are in place and say just because it is a law, that does not mean that it is a just law. And I think Bishop Jackson, along with myself and, and other clergy members and of all faiths, I think we would be able to find common ground in saying that injustice for one is injustice for all of us. It could be, it could be our son or our daughter tomorrow. Um, absolutely, there is a verse in the Quran where, you know, our holy book as Muslims, where God says that you have, and, and it's all over the Quran, it's not just in one place, but he says that it is incumbent on us as believers to stand up for justice, even if the justice is against ourselves. Like if we're the ones perpetuating injustice, it is incumbent on us to make sure that we're checking ourselves, right? So if we're complacent and we're crying, quiet, we're feeding that fire, right? And we're gonna get to that later in terms of what communities need to be doing. Absolutely. But that's something to keep in mind for our listeners because you know we're we're part of this whole thing and we have to figure out where we're standing. I totally agree. And yes, yes, Rabbi, please. And go ahead. So, so in, in one of the other shared um, texts that that exists, I know in among our religions, and uh, it is the idea that when we um, when we save a, a single life, it's as though we're saving the entire world. When a single life is destroyed as though we're destroying the entire world, that, that obligation that we all have each and every day to, um, to not just preserve the life of one, but through that, it's, it's not just about 
uh, it's, it's about, as you mentioned earlier, that, that humanity. Um, and, and when we don't stand up for the one individual and when we don't stand up and speak up in one situation, uh, we know that we're, when we, when we don't speak up, and I know that there are so many, I have so many colleagues across the religious spectrum who are talking about this in, in uh, specifically to this case, that we have a responsibility to speak up and to speak out, that we, as when we stand together, uh, our voice is not only stronger, but we, we have to remember that we have this, this responsibility, this God-given responsibility to, to be there for one another, to support one another, and to stand up for that which is broken. And when we look at this specific situation, what happened to Ahmad happened to be recorded by a friend of one of the murderers, which also in itself is horrifying. Uh, but it is evidence of the injustice that plagues the Black community in the United States. There are countless, as you refer to, countless other cases and incidents in which Black men are profiled by law enforcement and, and fellow citizens just because of their skin color. We all know that there are systemic and foundational constructs which have been institutionalized in this country. As a faith leader, what do you think needs to happen in order for that system to change? And, and not just as a faith leader, leader I think that's an important uh, in, in terms of, of how your words come across, but also as, um, as a, a not just a lesson, but a, um, a guide for all of us who are listening, who care. Uh, what, what needs to happen for the system to change? What can we do? I, I, think, that, I think that that is a, that is a great lead in to, a, to an opportunity to, to make a, a profound statement. And, and here, here it is. I, I think that we find in America that when an incident like the, the murder of of, of this young man to, takes place, we see it as a black problem. We see it as a, a problem in the black community. We see it as something that happens someplace else and somehow there is this, this, this virtual force out there that is to blame. But, but this is not a black problem. This is an American problem. This is a national problem. It, when, when we find ourselves in the 21st century seeing on, on video a, a, an individual gunned down in the streets, that should be very disturbing to America, not just Black America, but, but every, every nationality within America. It should be one of those moments where we say, this is not us, and it's not okay. I think that we have gotten into a place where we have made it acceptable to say the unthinkable, think the unimaginable, and do the deplorable. I think we have, we have found ourselves in that. There are freedoms in this country assured to us by the Constitution. Constitution. There, there, are, there are rights. That are, that are gifted to us by the Constitution. Thank God for the individuals that he created to, to put pen to paper. But with all of those freedoms and all of those rights come responsibility. And the responsibility says, I cannot bring harm to anyone to serve my own self-interest. And, and I think that the greater conversation has to be centered around um, are we a, a nation connected and united, or are we a nation divided and segregated? Because by division and segregation, we, we somehow are able to justify what happens to another human being who happens not to look like us or to sound like us, because, because we can disassociate ourselves. And I, and I think that that's the other facet of the dilemma for the greater American culture that somehow other people are other, they are other. That's a very dangerous mindset and it gives justification to wrongdoing. So, so as a faith servant, I, I, like, I like that better. As a faith servant, um, 
I think it is really hard for all of us to be able to sleep at night knowing that this level of disregard for human life exists, and it should wake us up every morning with a cold sweat to say, I, 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 I must do something about this. I, I must. I, but before I, I do anything, I must, I must find a way, I must seek guidance from God to be able to press so that this will not be the reality of the generations to come. That is on our shoulders, not on the shoulders of our children, not on the shoulders of our children's children, but on our shoulders. Pastor Barber, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but at the same time, we, we need to um, call people to, to stand up. We need people to understand the severity of this issue. Um, when we look at the systemic problem of how the foundation of this country was established in order to perpetuate and limit the Black community's growth, is undeniable and, and no one can say that that's not true. I mean, there's studies done in this, whether you look at the African-American women who, who can't access healthcare, um, co college, university, um, kids who have a specific types of name being, um, you know, denied job, even though they're as qualified or even more qual qualified than other applicants, um, housing, um, food, food insecurity, all of these things are tied to this system. And this racial profiling is another segment of it, right? And oh, we're, we're yeah. kind of tired of this constant cycle that keeps happening in this country. Um, but dialogue is great, but there needs to be some t form of movement to shake and break the systemic um, built-in foundation that has been there because we can tell people, well, what you're saying is racist or what you're doing is, is a, a hate crime or, or hate speech, but that doesn't change if you're changing one person, but the system's still working against you, right? I, I totally agree. I totally agree. But see, this is where we, we are a reactionary nation. This, this goes back to that initial statement that I made. It, it, this is not new, um, first of all. It just happens that this young man has, has the, the death of, of, of Ahmad Aubrey, it, 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 it strikes us at our core because we can see it. This is not a new situation. And all of the, the, the events that you mentioned that are underlying factors, the, the inaccessibility to, um, to resources, the, the fact that, that in this country that we, the nation was built on the backs of those that were enslaved, we, the, the fact that there had been um, systemic and institutional injustice um, toward um, people of color from the very beginning, and Blacks specifically, um, African Americans specifically, whatever adjective we want to use, um, those are all the things that have led to what, what in the minds of some people, this is what has led to making it okay to gun down a young black man in the middle of the street. We must tackle the, the horrific legacy of our country, the hate that is, that is so prolific right now because it's now okay to bring all of that to the surface and, 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 and spew it in, in language and in action. We, we must be able to connect the dot between where it came from. Yes, history, we know our history. I am the product of, um, of, of former slaves in, on the very, in the very area where I live, the farm that I live on, my grandfather far, farmed, and before him, his father, and before that, his, my great-grandfather even though emancipation had taken place, had to buy his freedom, all right? We are well aware of our history, but rhetoric really is only valuable when we tell the story. We have to make events turn into a movement. How do we do that? We have to do that, first of all, by saying within our own communities that it is not okay to roll over and accept injustice and laws that are not beneficial to our people and all people. That, that, that's, that's a start, all right? But then at the same time, we have to 
help our brothers and sisters to understand. I learned this from a from another mentor many years ago. Sometimes people who have a warped understanding of right and wrong, we have to physically get in there and help them understand that this is not acceptable. So rhetoric is one thing, picketing is one thing, marching is is one thing. But in a movement, there has to be some action taken. And we, the, the most effective way to do that, I'm afraid, in this country is to be able to infiltrate the, the, the power structure of our country. We have to do that through legislation. We have to do that through the unglamorous hours spent on walking the halls of um, our Capitol buildings, um, lobbying Congress, talking to members of the Senate and and being and doing all of the grueling work and saying that we're not going to go away. I, I often say, um, Inessa, that we are expected to march. We are expected to carry ticket signs. We are expected to make a lot of noise. What we are not expected to do is to have a view that takes us into the belly of the problem and that is to change the laws that continue to imprison and keep our people bound. Yeah. I can definitely say amen to that and we're all with you. Um, and you hit, you hit it right where it needed to be. Um, so I'm from 